dating can be treacherous. As I was preparing for this week, not only looking at scripture, reading books, but talking to a whole lot of single friends that I have in this congregation, whether they were single and college age, uh, single kind of young adult post-college, maybe in the military. I talked to single again friends that are my age, single friends that are older than me, single friends that have chosen singleness and aren't interested in romance uh, or marriage. But here's what every single one of those people told me as I asked them questions to help me with the message today. Dating can be treacherous. Even though there's more options and more opinions than ever, it seems like it's more difficult than ever. Did you know there are now more than 2,000 dating apps and online companies to help you find a date? More than 2,000 of those. There are numbers of books and blogs and articles. Magazines know that if they post on there the seven secrets to finding the one for you, that more people will buy it and they will make more money. Dating is a huge business. And there are all sorts of opinions out there on how to date, when to date, who you should date. And so before I give you today what I hope is really helpful advice and information, uh, I thought we'd start with some not so helpful advice when it comes to dating. These are from the hashtag unhinged dating tips on Twitter. If you want to have some laughs, you need to look these up. So let's start with just a few unhinged dating tips. Here is the first one. Look right into their eyes while you stuff those breadsticks into your bag. If they help you, they're a keeper. <laughs> Hashtag unhinged dating tips. Hold the door for your date, then rip the door off its hinges. Use as a weapon to fight off other men. Establish dominance. Hashtag unhinged dating tips. One more. Take her to the most expensive dinner you can and tell her you forgot your wallet. Hashtag unhinged dating tips. You can take that advice if you would like. Now, today, uh, I want to give you some advice. Uh, believe it or not, Scripture actually talks about this subject. Uh, like I said, I've read books on this this week. I've talked to a whole lot of single friends. And so no matter what age or life stage uh, of singleness you might find yourself in, uh, I think there'll be something good for you today. That's my hope. That's my prayer. And if you're married, here's what I want to ask you to do. Don't check out. Because some of you are like, oh man, I just came on the single week, right? Like uh, there's something for you in here. Because if you're married, here's what you need to know. Uh, you're an influencer. Like there are people in your life when it comes to this, su this subject that God wants you to influence, if you're a Jesus person, for good, to give them wisdom. It might be your kids, might be your grandkids, it might be a coworker, it might be a friend, uh, and God wants to use you. And if you're a Jesus person, it shouldn't surprise you that God wants to use you to help other people. Because if you're a Jesus person, you need to learn how to see yourself as an everyday missionary, that you are sent into the world where you live, work, and play to represent Jesus to the people around you. And so God will give you opportunities if you will have eyes to see and ears to hear on how you can influence the people around you when it comes to this subject. Now, I framed our uh, conversation today around four big questions about dating. And so I want you to grab that outline, open your app if you're, if you're taking notes on the app today, and uh, let's look at these four big questions about dating. The first question that we're going to look at today is, why do people date? That might seem like an odd question to begin with, uh, but it's not really because you need to know, especially if you're single and looking to date, not everybody dates for the same reasons. And so this is a really important question. Like, hey, well, why do people date? And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you three kind of answers to this question. Uh, two of them are, are good reasons why people date. One of them's a really unhealthy reason. One of the two good reasons are almost impossible for you. Um, and the one reason is actually the one healthy reason everybody dates. So let's talk about these real quick. Why do people date? Well, the first one is on one extreme. Let's we'll go ahead and write this down. For friendship. For friendship. Now, let me be clear. This is not why most people date. This is what they will tell you, but that is not why they're dating, right? They're interested in a whole lot more than friendship. Most people in our culture actually date in a way 
that jumps the friendship stage almost instantly. As soon as you enter romance into a dating relationship, you almost instantly skip the friendship stage and make it hard to be in the friendship stage, which let me just give you a little, a little you know, test on how can you know if you've skipped the friendship stage in dating? How do you know if you've skipped the friendship stage? I'll tell you right now. When you are sucking face, you've skipped the friendship stage. All right, if you're wondering, have we skipped the friendship stage? Yes, if your tongue is in their mouth, the friendship stage has been passed, okay? You are well past the friendship stage. Here's the truth. Honestly, there's only one group of people that I've ever seen date purely for friendship. Here's who it is, older people. I have a friend that I talked to that is in his mid 80s and uh, is widowed, not interested in romantic relationship again, not interested in marriage, but is very interested in companionship, uh, is very interested in enjoying life and enjoying life with other people. And so this friend of mine, he just puts all his cards on the table right up front and just says, hey, here's who I am. Here's kind of the life stage I'm at. I'm interested in sharing experiences and sharing life and, and true companionship and friendship but I'm not interested in romance and I'm not interested, um, you know, in, in anything like that. And, and that's the, honestly, the only group of people I've ever seen be able to actually date for friendship. Um, because here's what almost always happens. Someone eventually has other hopes or other expectations in the relationship. So just to be clear, most people, probably even you, this is not why people date. Although it can be, a very good reason for, I think, a very small percentage of people. Now, here's the next one. Let me t this, is, this is why a lot of people in our culture today date. Write this down. For sex. I'm not saying that's why you should date. I'm just saying this is why a lot of people date. In our culture today, sex has become almost synonymous with dating. It's almost like an expectation of the dating relationship. That it's just, you know, hey, that, that's just going to happen. And you need to know probably the person you're dating thinks that that should be part of the relationship at, at some point. And they probably have a number of dates in mind. And you just need to kind of be aware. This is how a lot of people live. But let me give you a couple of reasons to consider why entering sex into a relationship too soon is actually a really bad bad idea. And I want to give you a reason from psychology and brain chemistry first, then I'll give you a reason from scripture. So psychology and brain chemistry has actually discovered that when you enter romance and you enter sex into a relationship way too fast, way too soon, that it actually is very dangerous to you. And here's why. I recommended a book um, on the bottom of your outline. If you look, I recommended a bunch of books so if you're single, single again, friends, military age, college age, you know, whatever, there's one in high school student, there's, there's one's appropriate there for you. One of the books I recommended is a book called The Sacred Search and highly recommend it, especially if you are in an age where dating, your kind of goal in dating would be that, hey, it, it, it could end in marriage, right? Like my goal in dating is not just hanging out and companionship. Like I have a desire to be in that relationship or be in that kind of marriage relationship again. If that's you, I'd recommend the sacred search. I've recommended it before here. Every person that's ever read it has come to me later and said, oh my gosh, thank you for recommending that book. I read it. It changed the way I thought about dating. It changed who I was looking for. It changed how I see myself. Um, and in this book, I love chapter three. Chapter three of this book is titled Stupid and Vulnerable. And here's what chapter three talks about. This real brain chemistry that we've discovered, that psychologists and science have discovered, that the moment like romance, infatuation, and love enters a relationship, here's what it does. It's like this, you know, the, an hourglass with the sands of time? The moment infatuation starts or love, um, or especially if you have sex with someone, here's what happens. It, the hourglass gets turned upside down and you have 12 to 18 months of sand of love and infatuation that cloud your view and perspective of that other person. In other words, for 12 to 18 months, depending on until your sands of love and infatuation run out, you are what? Stupid and vulnerable is what that book says. 
You're stupid and vulnerable because you can't see things about that person that everybody else can see. Some of you know this from experience because people have told you or others of you know it because of a friend of yours, right? That, that you're looking at them dating that person and like, he's so wonderful. And you're like, run away, right? Like, and it's like, no, but you don't see him how I do. And you're like, exactly. No one sees him how you do. Like he's a loser, what are you thinking? But the problem is you're stupid and vulnerable because your view is clouded, you can't see reality. This is why people all the time don't see red flags in relationships that everyone else sees. So even if you're here today and you're not a Jesus follower, a very good reason to not go way too fast emotionally or way too fast physically in a relationship, even if you're not a Jesus person, is because you will get so entwined and entangled with that, with that person that you won't see things that later you will regret. Now, if you're a Jesus person, all right, scripture has a lot more to say about that and we're gonna get into it uh, in, in just a moment, but I wanna show you what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. Look at this verse. It says, God's will for you, if you're a Jesus person, is to be, what is that word? Holy, what in the world does that mean? Okay, because we can think it means a lot of things it doesn't. It simply means to be set apart. God wants you to be set apart. Do you know that God has special plans for you in your life? That he, he wants you to be set apart, not just living like everybody else in our culture or world is living, not because you're better than, but because God wants to protect you. And, and so God's will for you is to be holy, to be set apart, so that you will stay away from all sexual, what is that word? Sin, another Bible word that people are like, what in the world does that mean? Sin simply means this, anything less than God's best. That's how scripture defines sin. And so God's will for you is to be holy, set apart. So stay away from all sexual sin, anything less than God's best. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans, loosely translated Dodger fans, <laughs> who do not know God and his ways. Okay? So in other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying, he's writing to first generation Jesus followers in a, in a Greek city, Thessalonica, that's why it's called Thessalonians. And he's saying, God has a better way for you to live and handle your bodies and your sexuality. We talked just about sex and our sexuality two weeks ago. If you missed it, you can go online, you can watch it, you can listen to it. But here it is again. Essentially, this verse is saying the same thing we studied two weeks ago. So understand, for some people, they date for friendship, very few. A lot of people in our culture date for sex, which is a bad idea. And here is the reason most people date. Here's the reason most people date. Go ahead and write it down. For a spouse or marriage. That's why most people date. Now, I am not suggesting that you let that intention be known on the very first date. Hi, my name's James, and I'm here to see if you could be my future spouse. That's called date over, okay? No callback. Like, you instantly went to stalker status on that one. All right, like so, so I'm not suggesting that, but what I'm saying is that most people, if we're honest and healthy dating, healthy dating always dates with a goal and a progression in mind. Hopefully to start with good intentions, build on a basis of friendship, see if there could be deeper connection and compatibility, and then a desire to move towards marriage together. This is okay and actually the healthiest form of dating. And I hate to be the one to break it to you today if you've been in a long-term dating relationship and you're not yet married. If you've been dating somebody for like five or six years, let me just tell you, one or both of you are just holding out till a better option shows up. That's what's happening, right? Because healthy dating doesn't just stay in this quasi-commitment dating relationship. Healthy dating is always progressive. It is moving towards something. This is how dating should work. So that is kind of why you date. Uh, but let's look at our second question. When should you date? All right, when should you date? And I don't mean, is Friday better than Saturday? <laughs> like if we go for a hike on Saturday morning, is that, is that less, you know, pressure than a bit, you know, like Friday night? Like that's not what I'm talking about. You'll have to decide that for yourself. Uh, what I mean is uh, most people never think about if they're single, should I even be dating right now? Like, is dating a healthy option for me? 
based on my current age, my current stage of life, based on my goals, the things that I'm trying to accomplish, based on my emotional health? Like, should I be, most people never ask that question. And so let me give you two kind of statements for when you should date. And this is true, whether you're, you know, 45 or 25, like, like this, this will apply to you. So when should you date? Here's the first thing, write this down. When you don't need to, that's when you date, right? Think of it like the old advice, don't go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Why should you not go grocery shopping when you're hungry? Because you end up with a cart full of things you don't really need, you don't really like, and are probably really unhealthy for you. You're starving, and so you walk down the ice cream aisle, and you're like, mmm, pickled ice cream. That sounds amazing. Let's get, and then you get home, and you're like, this is terrible. Why did I? It's because you went shopping hungry. A lot of people date hungry. I think the kids nowadays call it thirsty, right? <laughs> Like, don't date. If you have a big need, and like, oh my gosh, I just need to be in a relationship so bad. That should be like alarm bells going off. Like, stop. Don't date when you need to because you will lower your standards and you will end up in relationships and probably in cycles within that relationship. Just like groceries, right? You'll end up with a bunch of stuff you don't want, you don't need, and it's probably unhealthy for you. It happens all the time. So don't date when you're in that situation. Um, let, let me show you a quote from Dr. Henry Cloud who wrote a book called Boundaries in Dating, one of the books I recommended for you. Look at what these um, psychologists say. Here's what they say. There is a very important rule in dating and romance to be happy in a relationship and to pick the kind of relationship that is gonna be the kind you desire. Don't miss this, look at this. You must be able to be happy without one. You must be able to be happy without one. In other words, what are they saying? If you bring your loneliness and your brokenness and your hurt with you into a relationship because you think that relationship is going to fix my loneliness problem and fix my, my hurt problem and fix my, you know, I'm not secure and confident and whole in who, in who I am. That relationship is only gonna magnify those problems. And that leads to this. The best time to date as an adult is this, write it down. When you are healed, when you are healed, dating will not fix your hurts or your brokenness. And those of you that are married know this, marriage only magnifies your hurts and brokenness, right? How many of you discovered that? Like, I mean, what does marriage do? I mean, here's what it does, you know, in my marriage, it shows me the worst parts of me. <laughs> Right? And scripture says, actually, God does that on purpose to keep doing his good work in us, that God uses marriage to refine us and shape us and help us become more like Jesus, which is selfless and serving. It exposes our selfishness. It exposes our sin. And so if you carry with you hurts from previous relationships, right, you're going to bring those into that relationship and they are going to be magnified. So before you date, you need to say, am I healed? Am I whole? Do I see myself the way that God sees me, that I am loved by God, that I am forgiven by God, that I am chosen by God? That God has a plan and a purpose. Do I believe that at the core of my being? That I don't need anything from anybody else. I am whole and complete in Christ. And when you're in that space, then it's okay to date. But if you're not healed, you need to let God heal you first. Look at the next verse in your outline. Psalm 147.3. In fact, these next two verses would be great for us to read out loud together. Let's all do that in our outside voices. Psalm 147.3, ready, begin. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. This is what God wants to do for you. If you've been hurt in a relationship, in a previous marriage, don't start dating or looking for another relationship until those hurts are healed. Let God heal your broken heart. Let him bandage your wounds. This is what God wants to do for you. You need to be relationally healthy, emotionally, emotionally whole, and spiritually secure. And so should the person you are dating. And if you are not and they are not, you're not ready to date. It's not going to end the way that you want. Now, this next verse I want to show you is a great self-test to see if you are ready to date. 
This verse is a great self-test. If this verse is true of you, then I would say you're ready to date. If it's not, just hit pause until it is. Look what it says. Exodus 15, 2. Can we read this out loud as well? Ready, begin. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me the victory. Is that true of you? The Lord is my strength. I don't need to draw strength or security from anybody else, right? I know who I am in Christ. I know what he has done for me. And he is my song. He is my delight, right? Like he is my delight and he has given me the victory. Those hurts from my past, from those other relationships, they have been healed. And if that's true of you, then I would say you're ready to date. Our wholeness and completeness is found in Christ first. Now, let me just make a point to middle school and high school students right here. Okay, not really on that verse, but on this point, because I, I get asked all the time, like, you know, hey, when, when should, you know, like, like, you know, younger students date? I mean, the truth is you're a parent, like that's kind of up to you. Let me give you what I think. This is not found in scripture. This is just my opinion and it's awesome. Okay, so here's my opinion. If you're a high school student or a middle school student, when should you date? If you can't drive and you don't have a job, you should not date. And what are you gonna do? Have your mom go take you there? All your parents are clapping because they didn't follow that advice. And they don't have the guts to tell you, don't do what I did. It didn't work, right? Like, no, seriously. I mean, you're going to have your mom take you? That's classy, you know? Dad, can I borrow 40 bucks? My kids ask me for 40 bucks to go spend on somebody else, not in our house. No. When you have your money, you can go spend it on that person. You ain't spending my money on that person, right? And now, again, that's just what we do in our home. Like, you can do what you want in your home. Uh, but, in, like, in, in my house, it's like, no. Like, like, I have two teenagers. Here's what I've discovered. I was a youth pastor for 10 years, hung out with high school students and college students, like, all the time, taught on this subject. And, man, it was so much easier to tell other people what to do. Now I have two teenagers. It's hard, right? But here's the thing. Teenagers, listen. All dating is taking you somewhere. It's progressing you towards something. And the problem when you date too young, you end up going to places emotionally, physically, and sexually that you are not ready for. And our culture won't tell you that. Our culture will tell you as long as it's consensual, it's all fine. And by the time you're a young adult, you've got all this baggage because dating in our culture with high school students is synonymous with sex. And you have all this baggage and all these hurts and all these wounds and, every, and nobody will tell you about that. And so take your time, right? Like you have, you, have way, you have plenty of time for that as an adult. High school, enjoy friendships. Enjoy the season you're in of, of having freedoms and playing sports and doing activities and being a part of clubs at school. Like that's what you should be doing. And parents, you know this, a lot of times when students start dating, all those, those real friendships that don't have romance in them, they, go, they become second. And a lot of the activities and things the students were in, they get dropped off as well for a relationship that almost always doesn't last. So, and again, you do what you want. I'll do what I want with my kids, okay? Mine will just be healthier. All right, let's move on. Um, <laughs> Here we go. That leads to the next big question. Who should you date? Whom should you date? Now, when it comes to dating, almost everybody has a list, right? And if you don't have a list of the type of person that you want to date, you should. Now, you know, teenage and young adult guys, I know what you're thinking right now. Oh yeah, I got a list, right? Like I'm not talking that kind of list, okay? What I'm saying is, do you have a list by which you say, here are the qualities and the criteria. If I'm gonna say yes to a date, like these are the things that I want that person to have or not have before I even say yes. Here's what I found talking to a bunch of my single friends. Most people don't even have a list. That's crazy. Think about every job you ever applied for. They had something they posted called a job description, right? And on that job description were a list of qualities and qualifications that you had to have to get that job, right? You had to have this level of education, this many years experience, all those things. Otherwise, you're not qualified for that job. You need a dating description where people must have these things or not have these things or they are not qualified to date you. You need to have that. 
And, and again, I can't tell you what should be on your list. Like you need to come up with that. Like, hey, these are the things that I want. These are the things I don't want in another person. But here's what I can tell you. If you're a Jesus person, I can tell you what should be at the top of your list. If you're a young adult or an adult who's single and, and dating or looking to date, you have a desire for a relationship, Scripture makes it real clear. There's something that should be on the top of your list that either says, yes, I will be interested in that person, or no, I want. Now, you need a lot more qualifications than this, but what should be at the top is spiritual compatibility. Spiritual compatibility. What I mean by this is if you're a Jesus follower, you've made Jesus the center of your life, date someone who shares that same faith direction. The Bible actually talks about this very clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at the question the apostle Paul asked his friends in the ancient city of Corinth. He says, can a believer share life with an unbeliever? Paul's asking a very important question here. He's saying ultimately every person chooses a trajectory of their life. Either it is a life moving towards God and his purposes or a life moving away from God and his purposes. And, and if you keep reading the passage, you see very clearly that Paul says, hey, if you've chosen to make Jesus the center of your life, don't link your life up with somebody who doesn't share that direction. Now, I know for many of you, these words can be difficult and even painful. And so let me speak for a moment directly to two groups of people. The first one is this, that those of you that are in a marriage already where your spouse doesn't share your faith. I know how challenging this is because I have several good friends between my wife and I that this is their story where they have made Jesus the center of their life and they're in a marriage with a partner that has not. And if you keep reading in 2 Corinthians, when you get to chapter seven, the apostle Paul says, well, hey, what should you do? What should you do if you're a Jesus person and you find yourself in a marriage like that? And here's what he says. He says, you stay married and you show them Jesus in you. That's what you do, that you don't give up, you pray for them, and God will give you the grace that you need in every stage and season of that marriage. That's what you do. And so the same advice Paul gave his friends, I give to you, that you don't give up, that you pray, that you let them see authentic Jesus attitudes and life in you, and then you trust God to give you the grace that you need. Now, the second group of people I want to talk to that, that when you hear this, like, you know, man, only date somebody who's a Christian. I know what some of you, this, these are single friends that you are a Jesus follower. And when you heard that, you're like, really? Do you know how hard it is just to find a sane, healthy person with a job? Now I have to add only Jesus followers to the category? That's like finding a unicorn, <laughs> Right? Like, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to find a date. And you are going to be tempted to give up on this one. You're going to be tempted to lower your standard or to give up. And here's what I would tell you. Don't. Don't give up. Because my married friends who are in marriages that don't match faith, man, they would tell you it, it just causes a whole lot of difficulty that if you can't avoid, you should. And so don't give up. Trust Jesus. Never settle right? Like that's, that's what you want to do. Trust Jesus and never settle. Don't give up. Now let's finish with our final question real quick. How should you date? How should you date? Okay. Um, now the best advice I can give you today is found in this statement. Write this down. Remember that dating is all about a progression of discovery. Healthy dating is all about a progression of discovery. All dating is taking you somewhere and towards something. You get to decide what that is. All dating is taking you towards, is it taking you towards unhealthy relationship patterns? Right? I mean, what, what is it taking you towards? All dating is taking you towards something. And healthy dating, your goal in dating should be a discovery of that other person and a discovery of yourself. Here is the progression of discovery that you should look for in dating. Almost all dating relationships and marriages started with this. Write it down. Attraction. Okay? They all start with attraction. There is nothing wrong with being attracted. You should be attracted to somebody that you're dating. You just don't want to stop at attraction and try to build a marriage on that. Right? We have nothing else in common. She's hot. I'm hot. We should just be together. Right? <laughs> because here's what, you know, older people would tell you. That hotness wears off. <laughs> 
that six pack abs turns into a kegger, okay? <laughs> like, like that's just what happens. Um, but there's nothing wrong with attraction. I remember, I still remember vividly the first time I ever saw my wife. It was 1994. All right, and uh, she came walking from across a room towards a group of people that I was hanging out with. And in 1994, jean skirts were in. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> because she's about 5'10 and a lot of leg. And she came walking up and I was like, who is this? Like I was instantly attracted. Beautiful brown eyes, brown hair. I had to know who that was. There is nothing wrong with being attracted to somebody. You just don't want to build a marriage or even honestly, just a dating relationship on just attraction. And so healthy relationships, they keep growing down this progression of discovery. Okay, I'm attracted to them. They're attracted to me. But you got to go to the next step, which is this. You need to discover about their personality. Do you like who they are, not just how they look, right? I mean, are they a positive person by nature or are they a negative person by nature? Are they rigid or flexible? Are they fun? Are they high energy? Are they low energy? Do you enjoy some of the same activities, right? Like all of these questions and way too many relationships. Here's what happens. In our culture, almost all relationships get to these two things. And people go, oh my gosh, you're hot, I'm hot. We have so much in common. And then they start having sex together or, or move in together and live together. And then they wonder why it doesn't work out later because they wait to discover the last two things I show you until after they're already emotionally and sexually and relationally intertwined. That's, that's too late to discover those things. And so a healthy relationship before you get all, you know, like emotionally intertwined and sexually intertwined and all those things, you, is there attraction? Are we personally compatible? And then you need to discover this one, write it down, values. What are their values? Values are the things that drive our lives. They shape our behavior and our choices. Do you know what their values are, right? How do they view and handle money? You might wanna know that <laughs> because all the married people would tell you the thing that causes most fights in marriage, money right? Like are, are, are people on the same page for how they handle it, how they view it? How do they see husband and wife roles? What are the values they have when it comes to a marriage? What was their home life like that they grew up in? Which single friends, here's a little extra point for free, okay? You want to know what their home life was like and what their parents are like way before you get serious. Here's why, because almost nobody will tell you this. Home number one almost always gets emulated in home number two. Meaning what they grew up in will show up in you. And so if you meet their parents, and you're like, oh my gosh, they're crazy. <laughs> Guess what you're probably going to end up like? They're going to be like their parents. Now, I have seen people who have overcome crazy dysfunctional families where they said, I grew up in that, but I am not going to become that. And I'm not going to let my family become that. But I'll be honest with you. Those are people are few and far between because it takes work to change. You have to be transformed. You have to unlearn old ways and patterns that you grew up in. And you had to decide that is unhealthy. And I'm not going to be that person. I'm not going to be a family that functions like that. So you better know. What is their family like? Because if they're crazy over here, woo, remember the hourglass, right? 12 to 18 months, which by the way, here's just a fun little story. Um, not in my notes, but this is so good. I just thought of it. I was preaching this one time and I was talking about that 12 to 18 month hourglass. Like, you know, you're drunk and stupid on love and you can't see if they're crazy. And if you discover things that you don't like, you need to be able to hit the eject button in relationships, okay? Um, and and I, was I was saying that and after the service, a San Diego police detective who's a member of our church, now retired, came up to me. He's like, you have no idea how true that is. He goes, I just got back from a conference that was a training for those of us detectives. And it was specifically on how to catch sociopath serial killers. And here's what they told us, a psychologist at this training for detectives about crazy murderers. Here's what the psychologist said, that the craziest sociopaths can hide their crazy for 12 to 18 months. <laughs> so
Some of you just decided you need to date a little longer. We were gonna get married. Let's wait six more months. Right? I mean, this is a detective telling me this. He's like the craziest people, people that bury people in their yard. You could be friends with them for almost two years and you wouldn't know it. But here's what that psychologist said. After 18 months, it almost always starts to leak out. Like crazy leaks out, right? Some of you know this. You were dating somebody and it was awesome for like a year. And then you're like, what did you say? (laughs) You think, what? Right? And so when you see there's a mismatch in values, you got to be willing to hit the eject button. Look at this quote from Boundaries in Dating. Look at this. Here's what it says. Values are sometimes worth living and dying for and are certainly worth dating and breaking up over. If you go through this process of discovery and you realize, man, the way they see that, the way I see that, that is so different. Like, I don't know that it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means like, I don't know that I want to be married to that. Then guess what you need to do? Boom, hit the eject button. Dating ain't married, okay? Marriage, hitting the eject button should be last resort and a a really, it's a really messy, difficult thing to do, all right? But dating, like, man, you see something you don't like, you see a value that's not clear, especially this last category I'm gonna give you, write this down. You gotta keep going down the process of discovery and find out their character. And if you see something in the character that you're like, whoa, hold on a second. Boom, you hit that eject button. And you get out. And what's crazy, I don't know why we think this. I've seen it in some of my single friends. Like, you know, they've been dating somebody for 18 months. And all of a sudden they realize, ah, man, this isn't super healthy. And there's some things I'm not, I don't really like. But then they tell themselves like, but I've invested 18 months in this relationship. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to pull the plug now. And I'm like, what? You gonna stay, like, you already realize there's some problems, but you're willing to give the next 18 years, right? Because you don't want to give up. That's bad math. <laughs> like, that's not even Jesus stuff. That's just bad math. Like, no, 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 be willing to give up the 18 months. Even engaged, friends, if you're engaged, and, and man, you got something in your heart or you're like, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Like hit the eject button. Engaged ain't married either. I remember talking to my mom when I was like a, a young adult and I, or college age, I discovered my mom was engaged before to somebody else before my dad. And I remember her talking about it because I was dating and, and doing that. And, and she told us this story and she was like, yeah. And as it got closer and closer, she was like, I just got more and more uncomfortable. Like, I don't think that's the right person. And, and there's things in, in that person. And, and so she talked about how, man, it was going to be a big deal, right? Because stuff had been sent out. Everybody was planning on stuff. But guess what she did? I'm so glad she had the courage to go, boom, hit the eject button. Otherwise, I would not exist, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, thank you, mom, that you had the courage to get out of that relationship, Right? And so, so have the courage. Dating is not married. You need to take the time to discover their character. And you know what character is? It's who you are when nobody's looking and it's who you discover they are when you get married. Because all of us can put up a front in dating for a while, right? We can put up a public persona when we're out in public and show you the best versions of ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. But man, when, you, when you're married, here's what character will do for you. Character will help you get through the toughest seasons that will come in your marriage. They will come. Difficult season, challenging seasons. And you want to be married to somebody that you know has character, right? Like character is what will help you get through the difficult seasons of parenting together. It's character. And so before you decide to intertwine emotionally and sexually and all those things, you better make sure you've gone through this process of discovery really really, really well. Last thing I want to tell you, your greatest friend, single people in any relationship, you know what it is? Time. That's your greatest friend. Take your time. And you know what our greatest friend, if you will, in our life is, this life of faith that Jesus invites us into? It's grace. That's our greatest friend. Grace. Because no doubt a topic like this brings up again a lot of those, oh, nobody told me, right? 
I mean, a lot of us here are, are going, I wish I would have known. I wish somebody would have told me when I was 16. I wish I would have heard this when I was 18. Others of us like me are like, I wish I would have actually followed the advice that somebody gave me, but I had to do it the stubborn way and learn the hard way. And here's what God gives us. This is what's beautiful about our faith. He gives us grace and gives us forgiveness. He gives us fresh starts. That's why we're gonna receive communion and close with a song. I'm gonna invite the band to come back out. Uh, here we practice open communion. That simply means all are welcome at the Lord's table. You don't have to be a member or have gone to a special class. Um, if you trust in Jesus, you believe in Jesus, I'd invite you to participate in communion. Uh, reach the communion in the seat backs in front of you if you would. Just get it in your hand. If you're in a front row, it's under your seat. If you're in a uh, parent viewing room, it's on the back uh, shelf there. Just Grab that and serve yourself or serve everybody. If you're outside, I think somebody will come around and serve you. Just get this in your hand. Once you have it in your hand, would you stand with me? Here's why I want us to receive communion. Some of you are thinking like on a dating talk? <laughs> what does this have to do with dating? It has everything. Here's why. Because every time we come to communion, Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do it to remember me. What do we remember about Jesus? Here's what we remember. That you, I, we are at the center of God's love. We are at the center of God's love that he gave everything. Jesus Christ held back nothing, gave his life, the bread representing his body, the cup representing his blood poured out for us. Why? So we could be forgiven of our sin. We are in the center of God's love. But when we come to communion, every time we eat and we drink, we are affirming or reaffirming, Jesus, we want you to be in the center of our life. And so when you receive communion today, here's what I want to ask you to do. Put Jesus in the center of your life. You are in the center of his love. Will you make Jesus the center of your life, the center of your dating life, single friends? Will you make Jesus the center of your marriage, married friends? Will you make Jesus the center of your career? Will you make Jesus the center of your friendships? the center of your family, the center of your finances. We receive communion. We say, God, I thank you that I am at the center of your love. And for some of you, maybe you need to take communion today for the first time saying, wow, I've never said yes to Jesus, but I want to. When you eat the bread and you drink today, that's your yes moment to Jesus. Jesus, I'm putting you in the center of my life. Or for those of us that have been believers for a long time, Jesus, I'm reaffirming that I wanna put you in the center of my life, in all things, my dating life, my career, my friendships, my finances. Jesus, I'm putting you in the center. Let's take a moment of silence and reflection, then I'll lead us in these elements. Go ahead and open that first little plastic layer there. Get the bread in your hand. Christ took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat the bread and rem remember Jesus together. Now, if you'll open the cup. Christ took a cup, passed it around to his disciples, said, this cup represents a new promise. My blood poured out for you. Let's drink the cup and remember Jesus. Go ahead and set that back down. Let me pray for us. And then we're going to have a closing song that says, the title of the song is, As You Find Me. This is a great prayer that says, God loves us just as we are, but way too much to let us stay as we are. So let's make this our closing prayer. Then we'll be dismissed. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for the amazing story that is revealed in scripture that we human beings are at the center of your love. That even in our waywardness and our sin and our rebellion, God, you never stop loving us. You never stop coming after us. You never stop knocking on the door of our heart to open it to you. And God, through communion today, our prayer is that we would make you the center of our lives. We reaffirm that. Some made that decision for the first time today. And so God, this song is our prayer. It's our benediction. God, that you love us as you find us, and we're so grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen.